One ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all. And in the darkness, bind them. The world has changed. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the air. I smell it in the air. Much that once was is lost. For none now live who remember it. It began with the forging of the great rings. Three were given to the elves, immortal, wisest and fairest of all Middle-earth beings. Seven went to the dwarf lords, great miners and craftsmen of the mountain halls. And nine, nine rings were gifted to the race of men who above all else desired power. Men were fickle, shallow, and driven by greed. For within these rings was bound the strength and the will to govern each race. But all of them were deceived, for another ring was made. Deep in the land of Mordor, in the fires of Mount Doom, the Dark Lord Sauron forged a master ring, and into this ring he poured his cruelty, his malice, and his will to dominate all life. One ring to rule them all. One by one, the free lands of Middle-earth fell to the power of the ring. But there were some who resisted. A last alliance of men and elves marched against the armies of Mordor. And on the very slopes of Mount Doom, they fought for the freedom of Middle-earth. Victory was near, but the power of the ring could not be undone. It was in this moment, when all hope had faded, that Isildur, son of the king, took up his father's sword. Sauron, enemy of the free peoples of Middle-earth, was defeated. The ring passed to Isildur, who had this one chance to destroy evil forever in the fires of Mount Doom. But the hearts of men are easily corrupted, and the ring of power has a will of its own. It betrayed Isildur to his death. And some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. History became legend. 
legend became myth, and for two and a half thousand years, the ring passed out of all knowledge, until, when chance came, it ensnared another bearer. It came to the creature Gollum, who took it deep into the tunnels of the misty mountains, and there it consumed him. The ring gave to Gollum a natural long life. For five hundred years it poisoned his mind, and in the gloom of Gollum's cave it waited. Darkness crept back into the forests of the world. Rumour grew of a shadow in the east, whispers of a nameless fear, and the ring of power perceived its time had come. It abandoned Gollum, but then something happened that the ring did not intend. It was picked up by the most unlikely creature imaginable. A hobbit, Bilbo Baggins of the Shire. For the time would soon come when hobbits would shape the fortunes of all. Chapter 3 Rings of Power You must hurry, Master Baggins for there is precious little time to waste. Take nothing you do not need, for the burden of what is to follow may prove heavy enough. But, Gandalf, I'm not sure I fully understand still. What have these ancient tales got to do with now, and where we're supposed to be going? Over the last of the tea, Gandalf had told you great historic tales of the Nineteen Rings of Power and their origins. You'd had no idea how much time had passed, as you were on the edge of your seat with interest throughout. What you did know, however, was the light outside was fading, and Gandalf had instructed you to prepare to leave. In a mix of head and heart, emotions and thoughts entwined in a chaotic tumble, you tried to make sense of it all, but it was unthinkable unimaginable. Your questions seemed so obvious, but it hardly made the answers any easier to digest. Hurrying around the house, grabbing some clothes, some food, water, and stuffing them into your rucksack, you strained to hear Gandalf's answers. It is as I say, precious hobbit. I have feared for many an age that this one ring of power 
hath laid in these lands in more recent years. But I too would dare not to think of it. You see, years ago, in the lands of the Misty Mountains, Young Bilbo and I spent a great deal of time in each other's company. But there was a moment of change in him, after one unfortunate separation of his from the company of our companions. At the time, he would not entertain me upon my inquisition, and he became rather secretive. I suspect he may have perhaps encountered a creature by the name of Gollum, deep in the caves, a being known to have, at some point, found and been enslaved by the ring. Years later, Bilbo showed me some of his trinkets from his times travelling. You know, rocks, keepsakes, among other things. But in this collection laid a ring, and of this ring he mentioned nothing. It was a featureless, smooth band, golden in hue. I told him my suspicions of the ring, and where he found it, namely suggesting the Misty Mountains. But he did not say whether they were or were not true. At this point in time, I did not know the true meaning of it. I have been suspicious for years. However, it is only until recently that I grew concerned and sourced the scriptures depicting the ring's creation. These pictures bore a striking resemblance to that which I saw in Bilbo's possession. Master Baggins, there is evil lurking in the shadows, and a dormant Mordor now shifts in darkness. But for how much longer it remains this way, I do not know. I fear Sauron seeks to reclaim the lost ring. And should they have captured Gollum, he may unleash enough information to endanger us all. We must find the ring. Until now, I thought it inconceivable that a hobbit of the Shire could possess something so powerful and known to corrupt everything it touches. The time has come, dear Hobbit, to find out before the enemy does. With every cog turning wildly in overdrive, you aligned Gandalf's words as best you could. Before asking a question you hesitated to utter at all. Do you mean to say that Bilbo is in danger, Gandalf? Gandalf said nothing at first, but his expression and heavy eyes told you what you needed to know. The One Ring calls to Lord Sauron, and whatever filth he entraps in his command. If Bilbo does, in fact, possess the Ring, the Dark Power Mordor will find him and take it. They will stop at nothing. We must journey to Rivendell at once. Thereafter, I do not know what lies ahead. And me, Gandalf? Where do I come into all this? 
Bilbo is my family, and I love him dearly. But how a hobbit like me is going to be of any use, I don't know. I am no adventurer or explorer. Oh, blimey, I've never even left the Shire in all my days. There was something in the way that you said this. In combination with your current state, that made Gandalf's expression melt into the warmest smile. Clutching your bag, with your little wooden toothbrush in hand, you looked and felt the embodiment of a naive, small-town village hobbit. It must have seemed this way to Gandalf, too, for he gazed down, not in sympathetic pity, but in quiet admiration. My dear Master Baggins, you will be surprised what hobbits are capable of doing, even in grave circumstances. Hobbits are amazing creatures. You can learn all there is to know about their ways in a month. And yet, after a hundred years, they can still surprise you. Turning away, you thought about these words of Gandalf's, and attempted to seek counsel in them. He was a wise old wizard, and that had to count for something. But there was still a question you held burning inside. Homesickness was already setting in, and you were struggling with it before you'd even set foot out your front door. Gandalf, will I ever return to the Shire? Again, Gandalf's straight-cut face bore the brunt of the answer he'd feared. However, the corners of his mouth eventually relaxed and upturned. He could sense you mourning the idea of forever losing the only things you'd ever known. Your friends. Your house in Bag End. The green dragon. The rolling hills and sheltered beauty of the Shire. Though I cannot predict the course of events to unfold, or what roles we must play in our lifetimes. I do seek comfort in that one day you will return to the Shire. You may be a changed hobbit, and one who sees the world a little differently, but I sense you shall indeed one day return. The two of you exchanged a smile, one which cemented a common understanding. A moment or two passed as you both embraced it wholeheartedly. Make for the township of Bree, not all too far from the Brandywine River. There, you will meet me. I will be waiting for you, at the end of the Planting Pony. You must leave your name behind, for Baggins will bring you no safety out with the Shire. Suddenly, and without warning, a rustle came from near the open window 
in the kitchen. Gandalf looked at you with eyes filled with warning and alarm. The rustle came again, and the leaves of a bush moved in the moonlight outside. There could be no complacency with current matters and the evil forces at play. Get down at once. Gandalf moved slowly towards the window, staff outstretched before him. He quickly jabbed it into the flower bed below the bushes, where an impact was made and a grunt was heard. Gandalf then cast his staff aside, plunging an arm into the undergrowth and in a swift arc, pulled out none other than your very best friend, Samwise, and threw him onto the table. Confound your Samwise, Gamgee. Have you been eavesdropping? Uh, I, I haven't been dropping no eaves, sir, honest. I was just cutting the grass under the window there, if you follow me. A little late for trimming the verge, don't you think? I, I heard unfamiliar voices, ones I didn't know. Well, what did you hear? Speak. Uh, n nothing important. That is, I, I heard a, a good deal about a ring and, and a dark lord and something about the end of the world, but, but please, please, Mr. Gandalf, sir, please don't hurt me. Don't turn me in anything unnatural. No. Gandalf glanced your way, forcing a smile out of you. Perhaps not. I've thought of a better use for you. Chapter 4 Bilbo's Discovery When Bilbo opened his eyes, he wondered if he really had died, for it was as dark as with his eyes shut. No one was anywhere near. He could hear nothing, see nothing, and he could feel nothing except the stone floor. Very slowly, he got up and groped about on all fours until he touched the wall of a tunnel. His head was swimming from the fall, and he was far from certain even of the direction he had been going when he had fallen. He guessed as well as he could, and crawled along for a good way. Suddenly, his hand met what felt like a tiny ring of cold metal lying on the floor of the tunnel. It was a turning point in his life but he did not know it. 
he put the ring in his pocket, almost without thinking. He went only a little further, then sat down on the cold floor. He could not think what to do, nor could he think what had happened or why he had been left behind, or even why his head was so sore. But, after a while, he drew out his little elvish sword, which had been gifted to him in Rivendell, and somehow it comforted him. Go back. No good at all. Go sideways. Impossible. Go forwards. Ah, the only thing to do, I suppose. On we go. And so he got up and trotted along with his sword held out in front of him and one hand feeling the wall. On and on he went down and down. Suddenly, he trotted without warning into icy cold water. That pulled him up sharp. He stopped and listened hard, and he could hear drops drip, drip, dripping from an unseen roof into the water below, but there was no sound of water flowing. So it must be a pool or a lake. Hmm. Deep down here, by the dark water, lived Old Gollum, a small, slimy creature. He was dark as darkness, except for two big, round, pale eyes in his thin face. He lived on a slimy island of rock in the middle of the lake. Bilbo could not see him, but Gollum was watching Bilbo from a distance with his pale eyes like telescopes. Gollum got into his little boat and shot off from the island. He paddled it with his large feet dangling over the side, but never a ripple did he make. Bilbo was sitting on the water's brink at the end of his way and his wits, when up paddled Gollum, his eyes glowing softly in the dark. Oh, oh. Bilbo nearly jumped out of his skin. He thrust the sword in front of him. Mr. Bilbo Baggins, from the Shire. I have lost the dwarves and the wizard, and I don't know where I am. Baggins, Shire, what, what's he got in his hands? My hand, a sword, a blade made by the elves in the Goblin Wars. Perhaps this 
sucks. Yeah. And chance for the to see my pressure. It likes riddles? Perhaps it does, does it? Gollum was anxious to appear friendly. Until he found out more about the sword and the hobbit. Whether he was quite alone or whether he was good to eat. Very well. We will exchange some riddles. Bilbo was also anxious to agree until he found out more about the creature. Whether he was alone and whether he was fierce or hungry. Right, okay. You ask first, then. Okay, Gollum asks the first riddles. What has roots as nobody sees is taller than trees. Up, up it goes, and yet never grows. That's easy. Mountain, I suppose. Does it just easy? Oh, it must have a competition with us, my precious. If precious asks and it doesn't answer, we eat it, my precious. If it asks us, and we doesn't answer, then we does what at once, eh? We... we shows it the way out, yes, yes. All right, you've got yourself a deal. Bilbo said this not daring to disagree, and nearly bursting his brain to think of riddles that could save him from being eaten. All he could think of was an old one. Right, um, thirty white horses on a red hill. First they champ, then they stamp, then they stand still. But we only has six, my precious. Then Gollum asked the second. My turn. Uh, voiceless it cries, wingless flutters, toothless bouts and mouthless mutters. Half a moment. I, I know this. Bilbo, who was still thinking uncomfortably about being eaten, struggled to retain his composure. Fortunately, he had once heard something like this before, and, getting his wits back, he thought of the answer. Oh, of course. Wind! Wind is the answer. Bilbo was so pleased that he made up one on the spot. Right, have this. An eye in a blue face saw an eye in a green face. That eye is like to this eye, said the first eye. But in a low place, not a high place. Um. Gollum had been underground a long, long time, and was forgetting about this sort of thing. But just as Bilbo was beginning to hope that the wretch would not be able to answer, 
Gollum brought up memories of ages and ages ago. <laughs> Sun on the beaches, it means it does this. <laughs> These above ground sort of riddles were tiring for Gollum, and they made him hungry too. So this time, he tried something a bit more difficult and unpleasant. It, it cannot be seen, cannot be felt, cannot be heard, and cannot be smelt. It lies behind stars and under hills and empty holes that fills. It comes first and follows after. Ends life, kills laughter. But Bilbo had heard that sort of thing before, and the answer was all around him anyway. That, my friend, is darkness. <sighs> Rats and filthy horrors. Bilbo was still trying to think of a really difficult one for Gollum. This creature was proving more tricky than he'd first thought. But surely there was something he could conjure. To gain time, he asked one he thought would be easy. Uh, a box without hinges, key or lid, yet golden treasure inside is hid. But Gollum hissed and spluttered and did not answer. What is it then? Come on. Give us our seconds, Robert. Give us a chance. Um, eggs, eggs it is. Because of the jokes, eggs. Now Gollum tried to ask something hard and horrible. This thing, all things, devours birds, beasts, trees, flowers, and it gnaws iron, bites steel, it grinds hard stones to meal, slays kings, ruins towns, and beats Bilbo sat in the dark, thinking of all the giants and ogres he had ever heard of, but not one of them had done all these things. He had a feeling that the answer was quite different, and that he ought to know but he could not think of it. He began to get frightened, and that is bad for thinking. Gollum began to get out of his boat. He flapped into the water and paddled to the bank. Bilbo could see the eyes coming towards him. His tongue seemed to stick in his mouth. He wanted to shout, Give me more time! Give me time! But all that came out was, Time! 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 
Bilbo was saved by pure luck, for time was the answer. Gollum was getting angry, and also tired of the game. It had made him very hungry indeed. He sat down in the dark by Bilbo. It's got to ask us a question, my precious. There's, there's, there's just one more question to guess. There's, there's. But Bilbo simply could not think of any question with that nasty, wet, cold thing sitting there next to him, pawing and poking him. He scratched himself. He pinched himself. Still, he could think of nothing. Ask us, Hobbit says, Baggins from the Shire. Ask us a question. Bilbo pinched himself and slapped himself and even felt in his pocket. There he found the ring he had picked up in the passage and forgotten. He thought to himself and spoke almost unknowingly. What have I got in my pocket? No, no, it's not, not fair. It isn't fair, my precious, is it? To ask us what it's got in its nasty little pockets. Bilbo had been talking to himself, but Gollum had thought it was a riddle. Having nothing better to ask, Bilbo stuck to his question. Uh, yes, what have I got in my pocket? Um, it must give us three guesses, my precious, three guesses. Very well, guess away then. Hanses, Hanses. Guess again. <sighs> Gollum thought of all the things he kept in his own pockets. Fish bones, goblin's teeth, wet shells, a bit of bat wing, a sharpening stone to sharpen his fangs on. He tried to think what other people kept in their pockets. A knife! A knife! Hobbit says. Wrong again. Last guess. Gollum hissed and splattered and rocked backwards and forwards, slapping his feet on the ground, wriggled and squirmed, but he dared not waste his last guess. Time's up for you, time is up. Uh, uh, Strong or, or, or nothing, nothing. Both wrong. Bilbo jumped at once to his feet and held out his sword. And now you must show me the way out. <sighs> and so Gollum did in fact show Bilbo the way out as agreed. A sly, slimy character as Gollum first seemed. He did at least keep to his word. Gollum pointed Bilbo towards the thin end of the cave with some vague directions and hissed 
a displeased expression of defeat. Gollum then got into his boat and shrank back into the darkness, pale eyes glowing, watching Bilbo every move. Gollum was not satisfied with Bilbo's riddle, and it scorned him. He thought and he thought whilst mourning his loss. His hands finally found his pockets, and then he realized something. His ring was gone. The answer to Bilbo's riddle, what have I got in my pocket? Furious, hissing and spitting with rage, Gollum thrashed his way back to shore towards Bilbo, accusing him of stealing his precious. But the hobbit had vanished. Bilbo Baggins of the Shire was gone. Chapter 5 Leaving the Shire Come along, Samwise. Keep up. Panting and out of breath, your friend Samwise stumbled about behind, fully laden with supplies and essentials, as a donkey would wear their saddlebags. He looked knackered, and you felt for him. However, under Gandalf's command, there was Sam. Drawn into this whole ordeal, almost against his will. Well, he had been eavesdropping, after all, and so, naturally, volunteered himself unknowingly, given the secrecy of the matters at hand. Phew, I am trying, honest. This load is rather heavy is all. <sighs> Samwise glanced across at the donkey with a look of disdain. It was comparatively free of load and obviously enjoying it. Sam felt it was mocking him, of course. Upon leaving Hobbiton, Gandalf had recruited the use of a lovely chestnut horse, which joined them at his side. Up ahead, at the foot of some woodlands, Gandalf paused for them to catch up. It is here that I must leave you. Be careful, both of you. The enemy has many spies in his service. Birds, beasts, all manner of foes. Remember, your names are no longer safe. We know not of the information the enemy holds. I sense they are looking for the ring, and you can take no chances. You and Sam looked at each other in trepidation, but Gandalf reassured you. 
I will meet you both at the Prancing Pony. For the good of us all, I must ensure Bree is safe to pass. Before that, however, I must return to Isengard and Lord Saruman. It is a treacherous journey, yes, but he will know of what stirs in the darkness, and I intend to find out. With a friendly tip of his hat, Gandalf mounted his horse, about turned, and rode off south. You and Sam would not see Gandalf again for a number of days. A rush of isolation flushed through every fibre of your body. Are you alright, Master Baggins? I think so, Sam. I'm just scared. This is all so much, and I'm nervous about what lies ahead. It's, it's okay. I I understand, but, but don't don't be scared. You've got me here, right with you, and I ain't going anywhere. Exchanging a smile of assurance, you both set off into the woods, donkey in tow. With Gandalf now gone, Sam didn't hesitate about lessening his load in favour of the donkey taking it. Much to the donkey's brief but volatile protest. With the sunshine high above, and the weather fair, it was quite a pleasant stroll through the hilly countryside. Thoughts and daydreams came and went with every passing mile. There was still a long way to go until you reached Bree but you were glad for Samwise's company. Samwise Gamgee was your gardener and best friend. He was a hobbit of average height, for a hobbit at least, but was more powerful than most, and had a strength about him which belied his gentle and sensitive nature. With curly brown hair and rugged, dirty hands, he looked every bit the working hobbit. He was cripplingly honest and thoughtful and could bear not to imagine hurting a fly. Sam was the youngest son of Hamfast and Bel Gamgee, and had many brothers and sisters. A gardener by trade, Sam seemed to be a simple hobbit of plain speech. However, his love for elves, his gift of poetry, and his belief that the world contained greater wonders than most hobbits were aware of, all nurtured by your uncle and his tutor, Bilbo Baggins, set him apart from the beginning. He lived with his father, Hamfast Gamgee, known commonly as the Gaffer, on Bagshot Row in the Shire. This, conveniently, was close to Bag End, where you lived yourself. In a very important way, he was your rock, your dependable, 
and someone you admired greatly. Deep down, you weren't sure if you'd have been able to set foot outside of Hobbiton if he weren't with you. Breaking through the boundary of the woods, you stomped across a boggy moorland, then marched the perimeter of a few cornfields before Sam, leading the way at this point, stopped dead in his tracks, where the edge of one field met another. The tweeting of birds and gentle grunting of the donkey were the only sounds you could hear. This is it. This is what, Sam? Only one more step and this will be the furthest I've ever ventured from the Shire. If I take one more step, it'll be the farthest from home I've ever been. Come on, Sam. It'll be okay. We've got each other. Just remember what Bilbo used to say. It's a dangerous business going out of your door. You step onto the road. And if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. For mile after mile, hour after hour, you and Samwise trekked across country. The sunshine came and went, as did the odd rain cloud, but thankfully for the most part, both you and your possessions stayed dry. That night, you set up camp under the stars at the wood's edge, and shared tales of your childhoods over some basic rations. Samwise had always been a hungry fellow, so found the limiting choice of food tricky at first. Along the way, though, he had managed to borrow a small selection of fruits and vegetables from nearby fields. This had boosted the variety on offer, but he dared not take too much for the sake of his guilt. The second day proved to be similar to the first with fair weather and varying terrain through the Shire and the White Downs. But soon you reached Brandywine Bridge, the main crossing from the Shire into the Downs. 
in the east of Eriador. You found that the bridge was damaged by some means, with many of the wooden slats either missing or badly broken, with some gaps spanning just within a hobbit's leap. This was fine for both you and Sam, but there was no way in which to escort the donkey across. After some deliberation, you decided it best to unladen the stubborn mule of what supplies you could not do without, and carry them. The rest were to be sent back with the donkey. With a heavy heart, you whispered a quiet few words in the donkey's ear, and ushered it off back in the direction from which you had come. It will be all right, Master Baggins. It knows the way home. I do hope so, Samwise. Someone will take care of it in the Shire, won't they? Oh, of course they will. Don't you worry. No harm will come of it. Later that afternoon, after having forded the broken crossing, you entered the old forest. It was a wonderfully peaceful place, with the breeze whispering in the trees, and only a few wild birds sang their rhythmical songs. Aside from this, only the stomping of your bare hobbit feet, and the gentle tinkling of some metallic supplies dangling from your bags broke the minimalistic sounds of the forest. The trees were a mix of greens and goldens. The sunshine speckled as it shone down through them. You followed a rough road which gently wound this way and that up ahead, the surrounding trees making it feel like a tunnel. Then something changed. The hairs on your neck involuntarily stood on end. Sam was up ahead, humming away to himself in a world of his own, quite happy and content. But something had changed. What was it? Looking all around and checking over your shoulder, your eyes were wide and weary, scanning the woods. You looked up into the trees, trying to relax your eyes, looking and reacting to any movements. You listened, your hearing pin sharp now, noticing every leaf that dropped from the trees. The whole place seemed quieter. The breeze still whispered in the treetops, but it was colder, a more distant sound like it was shrinking away into darkness. 
and then it became clear. The birds. The birds had stopped singing. All that was left was the very sound of you and Sam moving through the woodland and nothing else. Samwise. Sam. Do you feel that? F feel what, Master Baggins? You stopped walking again, gaze scanning all around and above you. Watching. Listening. Something did not feel right. You could sense it. What is it, Master Baggins? Sam's expression changed from contented to concerned as he watched your own face puzzle and alarm. Still, you could feel something, but see nothing. A lull in the breeze brought the ambient noise down to a deafening silence, which seemed to last an eternity. Nothing stirred. Everything was still. You looked at Sam, who looked back at you, unsettled. Then you looked beyond him, up ahead. In the distance, the leaves on the ground were moving, but they were moving fast, and they were blowing right towards you. The whole tree canopy seemed to condense around you. Get, get off the road, Sam. Get off the road. What, what, what are you on about? Why do we... Please, Sam, just get off the road. The pair of you scrambled down off the road to your right and tucked yourselves underneath the banking, beneath the roots of a great tree. There you waited, barely breathing, staying as still as possible. Sam looked at you, eyes wide and questioning. You lifted a finger to your lips, urging him to stay silent. Still, he stared at you, longing for an answer, puzzled, until a sound from above paralysed his stare. You heard footsteps, but not the footsteps of a hobbit nor a man. You heard footsteps of a horse. They were slow, purposeful, and chilling. The horse grunted and spat and scuffed its hooves like an animal in distress. This was no stable pony. The footsteps stopped. Silence. Then a metallic crash of something dismounting followed. You and Sam were frozen, breath held, eyes closed tight petrified. Your knees were pulled up as tight as they could go to your chest, 
straining to stay out of view. Whatever it was that dismounted moved closer to the edge of the road. It was right above you. It grabbed the tree roots above your head. And you dared to look. A sharp, scaly, armoured hand clung to it. The armour this thing wore looked like the foot of a dragon. You heard the thing sniff the air, trying to catch any scent it could. Did it know that you were there? Still, neither you nor Sam moved a single muscle. Finally, a crow cawed in the middle distance, alerting this thing, and it tore away with a frightening screech. Mounting its horse, continuing its pursuit. Sam and yourself still stayed beneath the banking, immobile, terrified to leave your spot. Minutes passed before either of you dared utter a word. Eventually, Samwise summoned enough courage. What, 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 what was that? I don't know, Sam, but it was not of the Shire. That sound, I've never heard anything like that in all my days. Nor have I, Sam, nor have I. We have to make it to Bree. We are not safe on the roads. We can make it by nightfall if we move quickly. And so you and Sam set off down the hill as fast as your little legs would carry you. Deeper into the woods you went bound for the prancing pony, where Gandalf would be in waiting. This was the agreement, at least. But if you didn't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to.